Thank you. The Honorable Member for Halifax Citadel, Sable Island, with 40 seconds. Mr. Speaker, I want to welcome 14 Oranges Software, Inc. to Halifax, which will be working out of Volta Labs in our downtown. 14 Oranges is, is a smartphone app developer based out of Vancouver. They just recently opened a Halifax office in Volta, their goal being to provide eastern touch points for their company. It's also inspiring to see that they'll be working out of Volta Labs, which is a local community hub that helps develop startups and supports frameworks. As our government always encourages innovation, it's nice to see a successful company utilizing a staple of Halifax's startup community. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you very much. Time has expired for member statements. We'll now move on to oral questions put by members to ministers. The Honourable Member for Sydney River, Myra Lewisburg. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and uh, my question through you is to the Minister of Education. Mr. Speaker, the school, Nova Scotia School Board Association recently have con concerns about the dangerous, I can't read that, dangerous driving where motors fail to stop for school buses. There has been a 1,100 incidents alone as so far this school year of motorists failing to stop for school buses. Dangerous driving and failure to stop puts children at risk. It should not take a tragic in incident to begin to tackle this problem. My question for the Minister is what is the Minister doing to improve safety of Nova Scotia children by addressing this very serious problem? The Honourable Minister of Education. Uh, thank you, um, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member. The member raises a very important and a very uh, serious issue in, in, uh, with respect to all across our province. Unfortunately, we have infractions where uh, motorists do not respect the law. They pass uh, school buses with flashing lights and they pass school buses with the stop sign out. And it seems that those numbers are increasing. The uh, Pupil Transportation Conference, of which the member speaks, is one that I've attended uh, most every year. And every year it comes up as a concern. What we're trying to do is to, uh, to educate the public that it is breaking the law. And I maintain that it is not the responsibility of school bus drivers to enforce that law. They can report what they see, but their job is the safety of kids on the bus. The Honourable Member for Sydney River, Myra Lewisburg. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank the Minister for her answer. Mr. Speaker, it is very troubling that the laws around stopping for school buses are being ignored. One of the problems that has been identified is that there is a lack of conclusive ev evidence to prove the offence. Some bus drivers have suggested that equipping buses with cameras that can capture the offence and vehicles license plates on video might help. My question to the Minister, has the Minister had any discussions with the Minister of Justice concerning the need to better enforce this part of the Motor Vehicle Act, including the feasibility of installing cameras on the some buses? The Honourable Minister of Education. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. And the uh, whole notion uh, and the um, opportunity to put uh, cameras on buses is something that has started in different boards across the province. I've worked with the uh, Tri-County School Board. Uh, they have purchased some cameras to put on their buses to record and catch the license plate or the make of the vehicle or whatever. But you've uh, raised a very important point is the enforcement of the current law that we have, we believe, uh, will uh, diminish the number of infractions. And uh, as the Minister of Justice, the Minister of Transportation, we recognize that it's important that we have the laws, we have the infractions uh, tracked, and we enforce the laws that we currently have. The Honourable Member for Sydney River, Myra Lewisburg. Uh, thank you again, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank the Minister for her answer because I think this is a situation that is worthy of a lot of consideration and certainly is something that bothers and concerns everybody that drives the roads and has children using buses. I wonder if there's, a, a, Mr. Speaker, if there's been any consideration given by the government to include in license renewal notices a notice about how important it is to follow the laws when it regards school busing because those notices are going out. Maybe this is another way to help educate the uh, individuals that are driving. So I wonder if that's a consideration of government. The Honourable Minister of Transportation. 
Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the member opposite for the question. Uh, certainly, uh, as the member had uh, identified, the, the education piece of, of these types of rules and all uh, rules of the road regarding road safety and, and how we apply that to the, the motor vehicle functions, and of course, uh, through the Department of Motor Vehicles with licensing and, and uh, fee, uh, the, the uh, systems that we use to uh, communicate and ultimately connect with Nova Scotia. So it is a, an interesting uh, thought. It hasn't, some, hasn't been something that we've considered specifically, uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, but I think given the, the statistics and given the information that we have and that's been brought forward uh, through the, the Department of Education uh, and the, the school boards on the ground, I think it is something uh, worthy to consider and we can certainly check back with the department on that. Thank you very much. The Honourable Leader in the House for the New Democratic Party. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. For the last two and a half years, our health care system has been deteriorating under this government. Meanwhile, Mr. Speaker, this government has been underspending on health care. Two years ago, the health budget was underspent by $22 million. Last year, it was underspent by $23.9 million. That's more than $45 million underspent on the budget in the last two years. So my question is to the Premier. With wait times up, ER closures up, and many Nova Scotians struggling to find a family doctor, why has the government underspent on the health budget by more than $45 million over the past two years? The Honourable Premier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank uh, health care providers across this province who are working uh, with our government uh, to, to transform the health care delivery model uh, to ensure, Mr. Speaker, that we are using the resources that we have in the most effective way, uh, delivering uh, the most cost-effective quality care uh, that Nova Scotians have come to expect. Uh, we're going to continue to work with them uh, as we work towards uh, ensuring, uh, Mr. Speaker, that not only do we have continue to have the uh, most uh, uh, professional, uh, top quality care that Nova Scotia has expected, but that we can do so in the fiscal envelope that we have. The Honourable Leader in the House for the New Democratic Party. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Last year, many community support groups were devastated by funding cuts by this government. Groups like Eating Orders, uh, Disorders of Nova Scotia, the Schizophrenia Society, and the Anakinish Women's Resource Centre all saw reductions in the funding which has a negative impact on the vital work that they do in local communities. I asked the Premier if there were millions of dollars underspent in the health budget, why did his government cut funding to so many community support groups? The Honourable Premier. Mr. Speaker, I want to thank again uh, the Honourable Member for the question. I want to thank all those organizations across the province who continue to work with successive governments to be able to deliver services to, in communities uh, from one end of this province to the other. We all know, Mr. Speaker, without the help of organizations, it would be impossible for any government to be able to deliver the services that we do across this province. Uh, we want to thank them for the work that they have done in the past, and we're looking forward to continuing to work with them into the future. The Honourable Leader in the House for the New Democratic Party on our final supplementary. Mr. Speaker, the Canada Health Transfer provides long-term predictable funding for health care and supports the principles of the Canada Health Act. And this year, the transfer to Nova Scotia has increased by $47 million, and I will table that. I ask the Premier then, given that the Canada Health Transfer has been increased by $47 million, why has the health care budget been frozen for the second year in a row? The Honourable Premier. I want to I thank the Honourable Member for the question. Uh, I know we're going through the budget estimates in the last uh, week or so. Mr. Speaker will continue to do so for the next week. Uh, but the reality is that she would know there were things that were in last year's health care budget that are now in the Department of Community, Culture and Heritage. There's a number of uh, full-time equivalents, uh, people, Mr. Speaker, that have moved out altogether into the health authorities. So she knows actually that there's been a approximately a $40 million increase in the health care budget in terms of delivering services to people of this province. <laughs> Speaker, she does raise a very important point. Uh, when health care funding went on a per capita basis, it impacted uh, aging populations like Nova Scotia and indeed all of Atlantic Canada. I hope, I hope that she'll continue to work with uh, the Minister of Health as we look for um, ensuring that any future health care dollars that the national government puts on the table reflects the reality of the demographic challenges that Atlanta Canada faces. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Mr. Speaker, Portland City Council met last night to approve their contract with Bay Ferries. They met in a public place. They approved their contract in public and the entire contract they have with Bay Ferries is available on the internet for all to see. Mr. Speaker, clearly Portland has nothing to hide. 
Will the Premier of Nova Scotia release the full contract between his government and Bay Ferries, including the management fee following Portland's lead? The Honourable Premier. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, uh, again, I want to thank uh, citizens of our province who work continue to tell us how important that international link is to the province. I uh, thank the Bay Ferries who have been working diligently with the Minister of Transportation Infrastructure Renewal so that we continue to make sure that that service is there. Uh, we're looking forward to the summer to welcoming our American tourists, uh, Mr. Speaker, so that uh, we can continue to see the kind of growth we saw last year in the tourism sector. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition on his first supplementary. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I guess that management fee will remain secret. Clearly, Portland is happy with their deal. No wonder they don't have to pay a cent while the taxpayers of Nova Scotia are on the hook for over a hundred million dollars over the term of the agreement they have, and they're not even allowed to see the whole agreement, Mr. Speaker. What we did learn yesterday is that there are nine blackout days, Mr. Speaker, during the sailing season where there will not be a ferry. Mr. Speaker, has the Premier calculated the cost to the people of Nova Scotia of those nine blackout days? The Honourable Premier. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank the Honourable Member for the question. Uh, it's not a $100 million deal. I'm uh, very grateful to work the Minister of Transportation Infrastructure Renewal has done with our partners. Uh, we have very conservative numbers when it comes to ridership. We will believe that number come up, which will reduce the exposure of the province of Nova Scotia. There's a review. Uh, at year two uh, for the people of Nova Scotia to have a look on a go-forward basis to make sure that uh, we continue to have that service, that international link here in the province. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I'm, I'm, overly, I'm actually encouraged today to listen to the leader of the Conservative Party stand up and ask about the fact that there will be a loss of revenue and the boat's not running, because he's finally now starting to admit there is revenue in the province of Nova Scotia. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition on his final supplementary. So, Mr. Speaker, the taxpayers are on the hook for at least $100 million. It's going to be more. Every day we find something new that's going to cost them. But the Premier cares so little about the amount that's being thrown at this service that they haven't even looked at how much those nine blackout days are going to cost, Mr. Speaker. And now it turns out that Portland can add more blackout days any time it wants, Mr. Speaker, by giving notice to the province, even in the current season, Mr. Speaker. So for all those tourist operators that are planning for this summer, for all of those ticket buyers that are out there, Mr. Speaker, they can never know for sure when that boat's going to run. All we know is it's $100 million, Mr. Speaker. How does the Premier explain to the tourist operators and ticket buyers that we need to keep it at least to $100 million, that we don't have the boat every day that we need it. The Honourable Premier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Again, I want to remind the Honourable Member, he, no matter how many times he re re repeats a, uh, a statement that's not true, Mr. Speaker, simply not true. It's not $100 million. That two years, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, it's a two-year opportunity. We're looking forward to continuing work with our partners, Mr. Speaker. We're looking for Order, please. The Honourable Premier has the floor. Mr. Speaker, it's a... Mr. Speaker, not everyone gets a chance to stand up and ask questions, so they got to yell across the floor, Mr. Speaker. I understand. It's not a problem. Mr. Speaker, but we're continuing to work with our partner, Mr. Speaker, to ensure, uh, Mr. Speaker, that that service is there long run. And let me tell you, every single small business operator that I talk to, Mr. Speaker, is positive about that direction, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable House Leader for the New Democratic Party. Mr. Speaker, there's a serious issue related to safety and security in our province's long-term care system. Uh, Health care professionals and other stakeholders are calling on the Minister for enhanced long-term care safety. The Minister of Health cut $1.3 million from continuing care risk mitigation in the budget for this year. Mr. Speaker, a cut of more than a million dollars to continuing care risk mitigation means staff and seniors are placed at risk. So I'd like to ask the Minister of Health, how does cutting $1.3 million uh, to the continuing care risk mitigation support the safety of Nova Scotian seniors and staff in long-term care facilities? The Honourable Minister of Health. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, and I'm getting quite used uh, to that theme uh, from the opposition that uh, more money uh, and money alone solves our problems. I'm pleased to say that working very, very closely uh, with uh, Janet Hazelton and the NS, uh, and the, NS uh, the Nova Scotia Nurses Union, uh, that uh, we will put in place now a coordinator to look at a five-year action plan uh, that will do much stronger professional development
relevant to make sure that staff and also patients are safer in nursing homes across the province. The Honourable House Leader for the New Democratic Party. So, uh, so I guess the Minister is saying that coordinator is free. It's a volunteer if he's not investing in it. We're asking him to invest in uh, long-term care and the safety of not only the patients, but the health care providers. Last fall, the Community Government Organization Task Force put forward several recommendations that would support more safe, a more safe and uh, efficient long-term care system. The recommendations included a call for additional training for frontline staff to de-escalate potential dangerous situations, Mr. Speaker. That requires an investment. The minister may believe that a 1% reduction in funding to long-term care facilities will not impact services. But he's wrong, Mr. Speaker. We know that less money means less staff training for frontline health care providers. Mr. Speaker, when can Nova Scotia expect the minister to act on the recommendations made by the task force last fall? We don't have five years, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Minister of Health. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. The 1% uh, reduction uh, is, uh, is going to uh, be captured by uh, nursing uh, homes uh, doing uh, more uh, cooperative uh, uh, purchasing uh, with, uh, with insurance, uh, with, uh, with supplies, uh, sharing services uh, for the first time uh, will allow those efficiencies. And what I can tell the member opposite in all Nova Scotians uh, is that the action plan will come here very, very quickly uh, as uh, solutions are being provided uh, by staff. The recommendations in the Broken Homes report, uh, the 15 are exceptionally strong, and uh, we will uh, uh, use those to lay out a plan uh, that will have much safer working conditions for all staff and patients in our nursing homes. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Mr. Speaker, a report submitted today to the UARB predicts that our power rates will go up because of delays at the Muskrat Falls project. It says that not only will we be paying for the Maritime Link, but we're going to have to find another source of power and pay for that as well, since the delay means there will be no electricity to flow through the link. Mr. Speaker, just last week, the Minister of Energy assured us in the House that ratepayers are not involved in the link project in any way. Well, they certainly are if they have to pay for it, and there's no electricity to flow through it because of the delay. Hopefully, the government knows about this. I'd like to ask the Premier, how much will our power rates go up because of the delay in Muskrat Falls? The Honourable Premier. Speaker, I want to thank the Honourable Member for the question. I want to be very proud to be able to tell all Nova Scotians, Mr. Speaker, that for the first time we've seen a reduction in our rates. We've seen rate stability across our province. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, I don't believe, Mr. Speaker, there's been another Premier bill to stand up in this House and say you've seen rate, power rates go down, Mr. Speaker, and rate stability, Mr. Speaker, over the next number of years. And we're looking forward to continuing to see that work happen. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Well, Mr. Speaker, it's a balloon to convince. It's a Mr. Speaker, that is just empty rhetoric. The government had the gall to bring in a rate stability plan with no idea whether rates would actually go up or not. And I hear what the Premier is saying, but with all due respect, this is what was reported at the URB today, and I'll quote it directly. Nova Scotia Power had assumed that it will start paying for the Maritime Link and its associated energy on January 1, 2018, regardless of the amount of energy actually available at that time. Nova Scotia Power will have to provide replacement energy for deliveries not made because of the Muskrat Falls delay. In effect, therefore, ratepayers would pay twice for that energy until deliveries from the link commence. Mr. Speaker, my question to the Premier is, when will he bring in a real plan for power rate relief instead of the increases that are obviously coming our way as a result of the URB decision? The Honourable Premier. Mr. Speaker, once again, the leader of the Conservative Party is simply wrong. Uh, Nova Scotians, uh, Mr. Speaker, are in a position where they have rate stability. Actually, what the report said, Mr. Speaker, that there would be a delay, which everyone who's been actually paying attention, Mr. Speaker, and been listening to facts would have known that delay is already in place. They would have also known, Mr. Speaker, that the cost associated with this project has been used by the Utility Review Board in, the, in, in setting rates on a go-forward basis, Mr. Speaker. And when the energy comes in, Mr. Speaker, it would, be, it would be displacing other forms of energy that is currently being used inside of this province, Mr. Speaker. The fact of the matter is, he should get over it. Power rates are stable. The Honourable Member for Pitcrow Centre. Uh, Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Health. 
Mr. Speaker, we want school-based adolescent mental health services and programming in all schools in the province. Dr. Stanley Kutcher has laid out a compelling model for early school-based intervention with youth. It involves improving mental health literacy and identification of mental illness in schools and connecting those youth who need it to the right primary health care. My question to the Minister, will the Minister commit to implementing Dr. Kutcher's model for early school-based intervention for all schools and students in Nova Scotia? The Honourable Minister of Health. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, uh, and I thank the uh, member for uh, Picto West uh, uh, for uh, uh, sorry, Picto Centre. Sorry, uh, I know that with his education background, uh, he has a great understanding of the uh, needs of junior high and high school students. In fact, all students in our school system. And uh, you know, I'm very pleased to say that in the three budgets uh, that I've been here in the House for, uh, we've added to the School Plus. Uh, program in a very, very significant way, uh, knowing that uh, on the advice of, of Dr. Kucher, uh, doing uh, as much as possible in the early years uh, is absolutely uh, critical. Uh, we are certainly underway with that, and uh, we know that there is uh, more to do and more to come from this government as far as supporting students in school. The Honourable Member for Picto Centre. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, helping young people earlier is the right thing to do. Even with uh, recent funding, we are only touching the surface of this problem in our schools. Identifying young people who are struggling with or at risk of mental illness and providing them with earlier interventions will give them a better chance to succeed. We also must support our teachers. They are often in the front lines in these situations. A question to the Minister. Will the Minister commit today to providing access to in-school health services, including mental health services, by qualified health professionals to all students in Nova Scotia. The Honourable Minister of Health. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I'll defer that to the Minister of Education, who knows exactly what's happening in every one of our 421 schools. <laughs> the Honourable Minister of Education. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, to my colleague for the setup here. <laughs> uh, thank you. But uh, to uh, respond to the member opposite, and it is a serious issue, we recognize that many children are coming to our schools with anxieties, they're seeking support, they're not often comfortable talking. So what we're trying to do in our schools under the direction and through the work of Stan Co Dr. Stan Kucher is to provide mental health clinicians in our schools so that those children who need the support of a professional uh, we'll have access to that. We've expanded, as we said, the Schools Plus. We have now over 200 schools that are part of a Schools Plus network. But we recognize, most importantly, that we need a professional who can provide uh, support, advice, and, uh, and consultation with the children involved. And that's why we have mental health clinicians hired through the Department of Health with funding from the Department of Education. The Honourable House Leader for the New Democratic Party. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Speaker, on Friday we learned that the Life Flight helicopter operated by Emergency Health Services doesn't have the certification level required to land on the helipads at the QE2, IWK and Digby General Hospital. The Minister of Health told reporters that Transport Canada informed EHS of this situation back on April 1st. So I'd like to ask the Minister, why did he wait almost a month before making it pub the public aware of this uh, situation? The Honourable Minister of Health. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, it was very important to uh, start the whole process of uh, getting uh, a helicopter in place, uh, going through uh, a number of the, those experiences uh, whereby uh, we would have the ground ambulance uh, uh, picking up a patient and transferring to uh, uh, the Halifax Infirmary and the IWK. Uh, we wanted to make sure that that system was going to be uh, absolutely uh, uh, performed in the strongest manner and that there would be uh, no interruption uh, of care to those who were uh, being transported uh, by a helicopter uh, from some part of the province to those sites. The Honourable House Leader for the New Democratic Party. Well, Mr. Speaker, that's just it. There was an interruption. It stopped on April 1st, and Nova Scotians just found out about it on, on last Friday. 
Rural communities depend on life flight helicopter services. As a result of the Transport Canada's recent decision, uh, I understand EHS has launched a new mobile ground, ground transfer unit about six months ahead of schedule. This will add precious minutes to the transfer time of life flight patients until a new ho uh, helicopter is in place, which could take six to nine months. Some of our most ill and critically injured patients depend on quick access to the care delivered at our tertiary care hospitals and the IWK. I ask the Minister, can the Minister assure Nova Scotians that his interim plan involving a new ground trans, uh, transfer unit will not compromise patient safety? The Honourable Minister of Health. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Uh, and having uh, been out to uh, view uh, uh, Life Flight and those uh, teams, uh, those uh, well-trained teams, as the member opposite uh, knows, perform uh, at the highest level of emergency care uh, each and every day. I'm pleased to say that uh, since uh, this uh, new uh, change has uh, taken place, uh, we've had uh, 25 uh, uh, life flights uh, into the IWK or the Halifax Infirmary. Uh, 17 of them were uh, time-sensitive flights, and uh, I'm pleased to report uh, that the care was provided and the outcomes the very best. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Dartmouth East. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Finance. Craft brewers in the province want to know why they're being taxed more than craft distillers and wineries in the province. Craft breweries pay 50 cents for every litre that they sell directly, whereas distillers and wineries pay 5% of wholesale, which is about 20 cents a litre. So they're paying double what their counterparts are. Many craft brewers say the equal, if they had equal treatment, they could hire more staff. The Minister is aware of this issue as apparently he and his staff have met three times with the industry since December and told them to wait for the budget. So the budget is here and the taxation hasn't been equalized. So why were craft brewers told to wait for the budget and why are they still being treated differently from wineries and distillers? The Honourable Minister of Finance. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the member for the uh, question. It's a great opportunity to highlight uh, the confidence and the support uh, that we do provide for the uh, craft brewers in Nova Scotia, Mr. Speaker. We've seen uh, in communities across the province of Nova Scotia the expansion of the, the craft uh, brewing industry. Indeed, in my own riding of Anakinish, Mr. Speaker, I'm pleased to note that we have the smallest craft, uh, pu uh, craft brew pub in uh, the province, Mr. Speaker, which they proudly uh, highlight uh, at their, stu at their uh, facility, the townhouse, uh, Mr. Speaker. As far as far as the, uh, the actual uh, RSMA, uh, re which uh, the member is referring to, Mr. Speaker, uh, and the conversations that we had with the representatives, Mr. Speaker, what I'd indicated was they came in to meet with me prior to the budget, Mr. Speaker, and like many uh, stakeholders raising uh, requests at that time, uh, I did advise them that it be considered through the budget process. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Dartmouth East. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, like the Minister of Finance, I have a craft brewery in my Riding up Dartmouth East, and with us in the gallery, Danny O'Hearn is one of the owners of the Nine Locks Brewery. Mr. O'Hearn has invested $1.7 million in his operation, and with no government assistance, now employs 11 people. And I'm sure that's a similar story to many craft brewers, one of the other uh, government members mentioned one earlier. And they're predominantly young people, as it happens. Mr. Speaker, will the Minister explain why, despite his government telling industry to wait for the budget, the end result was still a significant distance in, difference in treatment between not just craft brewers and wineries, but craft brewers and distilleries as well. So it's the only sector there that is receiving dis different treatment. And can he confirm a date by which he will make the changes to ensure they're treated the same? The Honourable Minister of Finance. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, again, I want to reiterate, uh, again, as the member uh, mentioned, uh, the growth of the uh, craft brewer industry is uh, continuing uh, under the current uh, framework that we have in the province of Nova Scotia. We're very proud of the, uh, the work of the entrepreneurs, as mentioned, to many young people across the province, putting their skills uh, to use uh, in many cases, Mr. Speaker, and some of these craft brewers, uh, you're seeing engineering students uh, putting together their skills in an entrepreneurial fashion, bringing together traditional craft brewing, Mr. Speaker, uh, within uh, the province. Uh, it's a great to, to see, Mr. Speaker, uh, with respect to uh, the specific question there and the, uh, the RSMA fund, uh, Mr. Speaker, I want to highlight that there are many requests that were brought forward to the government, Mr. Speaker, uh, on behalf of the Craft Brewer Association. Uh, we're considering many requests, not just the one specific one. So at this point in time, we don't have a specific date uh, defined, uh, Mr. Speaker. I'm not prepared to uh, give one today because it would be poor governance, Mr. Speaker, to move forward or make commitments on moving forward with the program when we don't have all of the details worked out. Uh, Mr. Speaker. So we continue to review the requests, Mr. Speaker, and we'll make the decision when appropriate. The Honourable Member for Pictou Centre.
Uh, Mr. Speaker, my question is for the uh, Minister of Health. The closure of Aberdeen Hospital's short-stay mental health unit is a devastating loss to our community. People were led to believe that this was only temporary, and now they learn that was completely misleading. This morning in CBC Radio, Linda Curry, Senior Director of Mental Health and Addiction Services for the Nova Scotia Health Authority, said the final fate of the Aberdeen Mental Health Unit won't be known until more province-wide decisions are made about providing mental health care. This is no way to treat our community. My question to the Minister, why did the Minister tell the community one thing and then do the complete opposite? The Honourable Minister of Health. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, when the uh, unit uh, first uh, closed uh, uh, due to uh, not sufficient uh, personnel, human resources uh, uh, for it. And as, we, uh, as it was investigated, uh, it was uh, discovered that it wasn't a certified uh, mental health uh, short-stay uh, psychiatric unit. It didn't meet uh, those uh, standards of care. Uh, so looking at uh, alternatives both in the community uh, and in uh, neighboring uh, Truro, uh, where there's a very uh, strong uh, team of uh, psychiatric and psychology uh, services uh, available to residents of that area, uh, I certainly have the assurance uh, that there is good community mental health in Picto. The Honourable Member for Pictou Centre. Uh, Mr. Speaker, mental health support is not better in Pictou County. In fact, mental health doesn't seem to be even a priority for this government. People are suffering. Some people are having to go as far as Yarmouth and Cape Britain for admission. And to make matters worse, people feel they were misled. A question to the Minister. Will the Minister finally admit that he made a mistake and commit to reopening the Aberdeen Short Stay Mental Health Unit immediately? The Honourable Minister of Health. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Uh, that was not a, an appropriate short-term uh, psychiatric unit. Uh, uh, people flowed through the unit each day on their way to other hospital services. Uh, you know, there was uh, many, many uh, aspects of that unit uh, uh, that would have had to uh, undergo uh, tremendous change. Uh, we now know that uh, in the community uh, we have top-flight uh, uh, psychiatric uh, services. Uh, people have moved across the province depending on uh, their assessments and uh, we know that for the, the people of Picto and what I have heard from uh, Dr. Vino and others, uh, the right decisions and the right course of action for the future is well in hand. The Honourable Member for Argyle Barrington. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I'll pick up uh, on the Life Flight helicopter once again. Uh, you know, we know that that means that uh, from that announcement, from those changes to the life flight uh, helicopter, that it can no longer land at the IWK, the QE2, or at the Digby Hospital. Now, the minister has said uh, a couple of things along the way, whether uh, he found out on April 1st or whether he was caught blindsided on this one. Uh, I just wonder what the, what the debate has been or what kind of uh, information was provided to the minister on, on when this was going to happen. So can the minister enlighten us on when he actually found out? Uh, that the life flight helicopter would not be able to use as it was planned. The Honourable Minister of Health. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, it was uh, uh, on the afternoon of uh, April 1st uh, that, uh, that, the, uh, that EHS, uh, in fact, uh, uh, found out that the service uh, uh, would, uh, or on April 1st, they had to uh, uh, eliminate flights into the IWK and the Halifax Infirmary, Digby General, uh, and, uh, and within uh, about 48 hours, uh, I was meeting with uh, EHS, uh, their team of people, uh, to, uh, to get the information as to why uh, the flights could no longer uh, go into uh, uh, those uh, facilities. Uh, the new standards that uh, Transport Canada had put in place uh, now uh, require this change. The Honourable Member for Argyle Barrington. Um, Mr. Speaker, you know, in, what troubles me throughout this discussion is at what point did Canadian Helicopters or our provider actually inform uh, the Minister of the Department that their helicopters would not be able to be used uh, in the way that it had been done in the past. Uh, we know that we need a service that is available to patients 365 days of the year and apparently because of the age of the helicopter and the new regulations that it is not. So my question to the minister is that knowing everything that, that, that he does know today, 
um, you know, what is going to be the added cost to this program as Canadian Helicopters or EHS has to go out and source another helicopter? The Honourable Minister of Health. What I, what I can tell uh, the member opposite uh, and all Nova Scotians uh, is that this is a, uh, a first-rate service uh, uh, for Nova Scotians. Many lives are saved uh, because of this service. And uh, at the same table, when I, uh, when I found out uh, what was taking place, I gave an immediate directive uh, to uh, go into procurement of, uh, of the next generation of a, of a helicopter. And uh, uh, we know that this is a, a service that must be provided, and our government will support the procurement and the new lease. The Honourable Member for Northside Westmount. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question is also to the Minister of Health. The pain clinic at the Northside General is undergoing some transitions because the lead physician is looking at retirement. The physician is looking at succession plans, but has been told by the health authority the level of staff currently employed is not needed. The clinic sees 80% of the pain patients in the area, while only 20% are being seen at the regional hospital. The clinic employs two well-trained and capable nursing staff who assist the physicians. So my question to the minister is, has the minister done any consultation with staff at the Northside General Pain Clinic to ensure that the level and quality of care will be met after the clinic changes hands? The Honourable Minister of Health. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. And uh, what I convey to uh, uh, the member for, uh, for Northside Victoria is that uh, the, uh, we, can, uh, we can assure everybody in that area that uses the pain clinic, uh, that there will be uh, no disruption in service. Uh, he's absolutely right. Uh, they have a couple of uh, top flight uh, providers, uh, both in terms of doctors and nurses and support staff. All of the supplies, all of those areas will be supported to the same extent. The Honourable Member for Northside Westmount. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, we know physician recruitment can be difficult, especially in Cape Breton. Northside General has consistently been overlooked and unable to offer the services needed by the general public. As of now, we're lucky enough to have an esteemed doctor and dedicated physician to manage this facility. The people of Cape Breton need to know that the clinic will be able to handle the volume, the staffing levels, and the same high quality of care. So again, my question is the Minister, what are you doing to guarantee that that volume and quality of care will be provided at the Northside General and not at the Cape Breton Regional Hospital so people won't have to travel to receive the services? The Honourable Minister of Health. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, if it's an 80-20 split currently, obviously there's a lot of people traveling in one direction for care now. But what I can say is that the, uh, the doctor referenced it here uh, is interested in applying for the uh, directorship of the entire pain clinic uh, and its uh, management uh, in the Cape Breton uh, area. And I'm pleased to, to hear that uh, he is staying on for the time being. And uh, I know that uh, recruitment uh, uh, is certainly uh, top of uh, mind uh, for the NSHA to make sure that support to patients uh, with chronic pain uh, have their uh, needs met. The Honourable Member for Truro, Bible Hill, Millbrook, Salmon River. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Last May, the Minister of Health promised that a sexual assault nurse examiner program would be up and running in Sydney by the fall of 2015. He said at the time that the team would include as many as 16 registered nurses with specialized training, and he also committed to establish a SANE site in Western Nova Scotia. So, Mr. Speaker, it's one year later, and we now know that this is yet another broken promise, but this time a broken promise to survivors of sexual assault. So my question, Mr. Speaker, Speaker, how can the minister justify not acting on his promises to survivors of sexual assault? The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the member opposite uh, for the question. I think it's about six months and not a year uh, since I was in Sydney to, uh, uh, to hear from people who were interested in uh, uh, setting up and being part of the sexual assault clinic. Uh, where she received the information on 16 nurses uh, uh, is certainly uh, not in any notes that uh, I provided or information orally in that area. Uh, so what I'm pleased to say is that the RFP has gone out uh, for, uh, for, the, uh, for, the, for the SANE program uh, in Cape Breton as well as for the western part of the, of the province. Uh, and uh, one of the areas that we discovered uh, needed a lot of work while we have a great 
uh, clinic in the Avalon Sexual Assent Center. Uh, we also needed to review the criteria in setting up a new facility. The Honorable Member for Truro, Bible Hill, Millbrook, Salmon River. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, actually, it was a year. In fact, it was uh, written about in May 20th of last year in the Sydney newspaper, and they mentioned that he had said that the team would include as many as 16 registered nurses. I'll table that. So, Mr. Speaker, the minister can talk about his RFP or re-announcement of money as much as he likes, but it doesn't change the fact that he made a promise to survivors of sexual assault, and he's broken it. And it's been a whole year since the minister made commitments to women and to men across no Nova Scotia that they would not be forced to travel for hours to see sexual assault nurse examiners. So, my speak, Mr. Speaker, we've waited long enough, and the inaction by government is inexcusable. So, my question is, when will the sexual assault nurse examiner program be expanded to the underserved areas of Nova Scotia? The Honourable Minister of Health. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. What I'm pleased to say is that uh, it's, it's not just uh, these two areas now that uh, we are addressing. Uh, we actually have uh, hired a provincial coordinator uh, that will look at uh, SANE programs and other related services uh, for those suffering from uh, sexual assault. And uh, we will, in fact, see expansion of this uh, uh, program and related services uh, across Nova Scotia. And uh, uh, we know that uh, this will uh, uh, be provided uh, during this fiscal year. The Honourable Member for Colchester, Muskegon, Valley. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Health. This is your day, sir. <laughs> Recently, the number of deaths caused by violence in nursing, nursing homes uh, has been made public. And, of course, many of these incidents... Uh, are attributed to those suffering with dementia-related or other mental health issues. And the families of those people, of course, uh, are very concerned. One death caused by another is certainly one too many, we know that. The reports produced on the incidents indicated that the challenging behavior expert employed by the province was not made use of in cases where a resident had violent tendencies. And I'm going to table that. My question is, will the minister be changing the policy so that all nursing homes, residential care facilities are required to make use of the challenging behavior expert going forward. Yeah. The Honourable Minister of Health. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and, uh, and I thank the uh, member uh, for a, a very, very important uh, question uh, that he has brought here to the floor of the legislature today. Uh, this is an area now that uh, perhaps uh, long overdue in uh, being fully uh, addressed. And uh, what I can uh, tell the member opposite and all Nova Scotians uh, is that uh, whenever there is a major uh, event, a very serious uh, uh, incident, uh, not just one that, uh, that has caused the death, uh, but all of these are investigated, uh, recommendations made, and uh, there is a follow-up so that the, the seed of the recommendations were uh, put into effect. And also there is an unannounced visit uh, to also review uh, those recommendations that were made. The Honourable Member for Colchester, Muscadabit Valley. Uh, the Nurses' Union has expressed concern about the number of staff that are on duty uh, at the many facilities, citing that more staff would make things safer. I know I have talked to a few nurses who were backed into corners and, and physically harmed. The government has uh, invested in more training programs for violence de-escalation this year, but there are no signs that this will necessarily address staff safety and staffing levels. Will the minister include staffing level plans and a prevention plan that all Nova Scotians can feel safe about? The Honourable Minister of Health. Uh, thank you very much, and I uh, thank the member for that important question. Uh, I have met uh, with uh, Janet Hazelton on this uh, issue specifically and only, as well as the Deputy Minister, as well as staff. 
uh, we certainly see that the 15 uh, recommendations uh, brought forth uh, in the Broken Homes uh, report, uh, they are going to be uh, prioritized. I asked uh, that uh, those ones involving uh, staff uh, safety uh, get the utmost uh, attention. And in fact, uh, we will now, we're now in the process of developing a five-year action plan uh, that will indeed reduce the number of incidents, make the workplace uh, safer. It's also where WCB has the highest uh, number uh, of claims relating to uh, health care. Uh, we know we have to address it and pleased to be working uh, with, uh, with uh, nurses and all staff to make that work environment safer. The Honourable Member for Pictou East. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Education. Uh, Minister, the uh, East Pictou Middle School has reached the end of its life. It's been through a school review process and the community agreed unanimously, uh, as the board also agreed, that uh, the middle school should be closed and renovations should be done to uh, the Frank H. McDonald to convert Frank H. McDonald into, into a PD8 school. This project has been a top priority of the Chignectra Central Regional School Board for the last couple of years. Uh, it seems like everyone agrees, except maybe the department. So my question for the minister is, does the Department of Education support those renovations to Frank H. to convert it to a PD8? The Honourable Minister of Education. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you for raising the question. Uh, I believe it came as a question last time we were sitting in the House, and, and I do recognize, I know the facility, uh, I know uh, the work that was done at W.A. McLeod, and I believe that the Board wants to follow a similar model when they move into FH. Uh, I know that the Board has submitted that, and the process that has been followed is that Boards identify those. We look at our capital plan, and we look at where, when, and how we can accommodate some of those requests. And so I would say to the member, um, the uh, process to date has been followed. The decision about when and how uh, that is responded to uh, will be forthcoming. The Honourable Member for Pictou East. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Minister for that response. The, the concern in the community is time sticking. Uh, it's been a couple years now. This has been a top priority of the Board. Uh, we haven't seen any action upon it, and the, and the school review process has a shelf life. And it is as uh, with every year that passes, that shelf life gets a little, a little shorter. And we're, there's a risk here now that this could have to go back through another school review process. Certainly, people in the community don't want that. They want, they want to move forward with, uh, with the renovations to Frank H. So I would just maybe see if I can pinhole the minister a little bit on, on when this, we might see some, something from the department as to hit how this could happen. The Honourable Minister of Education. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And uh, I'm well aware of the five-year window. Uh, I know that that window is closing. Uh, I would not want the community to go through the same process again. The Honourable Member for Truro, Bible Hill, Millbrook, Salmon River. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is again for the Minister of Health. A report commissioned by the Department of Health and Wellness indicated a target of 20 midwives by the year 2017. At this time, midwifery services are limited to only three sites across Nova Scotia. When asked in this House, the Minister said the Health Authority is now doing a clinical services review and women will have to wait until that is complete before midwifery services are expanded. So, Mr. Speaker, will the Minister provide this House for plans to expand midwifery services, a timeline for that across Nova Scotia? The Honourable Minister of Health. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker, and uh, I thank the member opposite for uh, raising a very important uh, uh, topic, a very, very important uh, women's uh, uh, issue, and really uh, a family issue uh, that many Nova Scotians uh, uh, do want to use uh, midwifery uh, services. Uh, we know how strong their, uh, their, their prenatal, the birthing, and in particular the postnatal care uh, that midwifery uh, does provide and especially uh, as an assist to uh, uh, very busy uh, obstetrician gynecologists and uh, I will rely uh, on that clinical services review uh, before we make and expand a provincial plan. 
The Honorable Member for Truro, Bible Hill, Millbrook, Salmon River. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And it's true, Nova Scotia has actually had difficulty recruiting obstetricians, and many across the provinces either have or are retiring. We know that women who have access to midwives experience fewer preterm births, shorter hospital stays, fewer interventions during labor, and they breastfeed more often and longer. I'll table that. And so, Mr. Speaker, the demand for midwifery services far exceeds the capacity of a very small number of employed midwives. So my question for the minister is, can the minister explain how his government plans to support this expansion and integration of midwifery services across the province? The Honourable Minister of Health. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker, and pleased to say that uh, where we have those services uh, available, and the one I am most familiar with uh, uh, is on the uh, south shore of uh, Nova Scotia. Uh, that service, in fact, is, uh, uh, is, is used by some families uh, in the valley uh, where I live, and uh, they certainly speak uh, glowingly about the midwives who provide uh, that service. And uh, we know that uh, the Nova Scotia Health Authority uh, needs to have uh, the right plan in place, uh, work with the uh, IWK uh, on providing this uh, service uh, across the province, and uh, I think the member opposite uh, uh, will see this uh, unfold. The Honourable Member for Kings North. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Business. Last week, the Auditor General's report came out on the follow-up of the 2012-2013 recommendations. In uh, Appendix 1 of the Business Department, the Appendix 1, the Business Department is listed as having a 3% completion rate. That's a very low rate. It's one of the lowest rates of any department, Mr. Speaker. My question for the Minister is this. Can he explain why his department has received this failing grade in such a low score, given the amount of time since 2012-2013 that ERDT and now the Department of Business has had to deal with these issues? The Honourable Minister of Business. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, I've had the opportunity to, uh, to engage my, my colleague uh, during budget estimates. Order, and, please. Uh, Time allotted for oral questions put by members to ministers has expired. We'll now move on to government business. The Honorable Deputy Government House Leader. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I move that you do now leave the chair and the House resolve itself into a committee of the whole on supply. The Honourable Member for Argyle Barrington. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. It's my pleasure uh, to take my turn and stand speaking into, uh, into supply. And, Mr. Speaker, it's always a great opportunity to to A, talk about uh, your constituency, uh, what you're hearing or, or, or seeing in your, in your area, what you're hearing from your constituents uh, about the budget and, and about the things that are generally important uh, to, uh, to them uh, on government services of, what, uh, of what's important. You know, Mr. Speaker, um, the constituency of Argyle Barrington uh, is one that is, uh, is a very lucky one. And by lucky, I mean over the last number of the last number of years, uh, we've seen a traumatic change. Um